Thank you very much, Stephen and Andy, and uh, thanks to everyone at EduServe who's organised this and put this together. Welcome to everyone in the audience. Um, what I'll be covering today is EMC's position on the big data markets. Uh, uh, just over about two years ago, EMC started getting very interested uh, in this space, and as the leading provider of, of storage uh, into uh, public sector organisations uh, as well as into the enterprise, uh, we have a very, very big focus on this area. Uh, we've made a number of strategic acquisitions in this space uh, to ensure our, our technology leadership. Here, uh, my former company, Isilon, is one of those. Uh, I'll be speaking as well about another one called Greenplum. Uh, we'll continue to be making a number of acquisitions in this space, as well as developing our own technologies and services uh, to complement our, our, our portfolio. Those things are going to come back to uh, towards the end. I'm going to try and not be, uh, have this be uh, very product focused. I'd really like to keep this high level and just kind of set the tone for the rest of the day. You're going to have some fantastic uh, examples today from the speakers uh, about the own their own environments, what they've built out, uh, and some very good examples of how to grapple with the big data problem. Uh, I find myself in the different areas I go into, it's really a different way of tackling the problem everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm ho hopefully, hopefully I'll highlight some of the things that I think are common among some of those environments, but you'll find the, the means of analyses, the, the ways you store and retrieve data is very different uh, from case to case. Uh, and big data is sort of, uh, you highlighted I think before that uh, you know, big data has still got a lot of hype around it, uh, and I think that's a, a, very, uh, a very good point. I think in a lot of cases that there is a huge amount of hype in the big data space uh, I'll try to bring it down to a concrete level and show you what we're actually seeing. Uh, and I think, as I said, uh, throughout the day, you'll, you'll get some uh, even better examples. So the one thing that everybody always starts with in keynotes with big data is, God, there's a lot of it. There's a huge amount of data. I actually don't think that's the most important point about big data is the size of it. And actually, most of the new cases that I'm seeing emerging in things like the uh, financial services space or retail we're not really talking about enormous amounts of data. It might be a huge amount of data compared to what that organization's done before, but it's not necessarily petabytes of data. But we'll, we'll start with this anyway, just to point out that there is an enormous amount of data and the growth rates are very high, and I think that's important to us all. Um, the quantity of data we've got stored is already really more than we can already analyze. Uh, and really, big data is a lot about not accumulating more data, but just finding better ways of analyzing what we already have. And that leads to the next challenge, which is that most of that data is not in a form that we can readily analyze. So we're very used to, and this is true for EMC as well, EMC is a company with a history in block storage, in structured data, structured access, um, and, uh, and also BI. And all of those things are very different than the world of big data, where we're dealing a lot with flat files, we're dealing with video, we're dealing with images, uh, we're dealing with genomics data uh, and things that are, are analyzed in very exotic ways and very different uh, in different ways than what we're used to. And so that's really the primary problem. And if you look at the, the, the directions that EMC are going in in terms of the technologies, it's very much focused in this direction, towards object, towards unstructured, uh, towards ways of experimenting with that sort of data to come out with insights. So some of the areas that we're starting to see uh, out there um, started off really in areas of uncomputable big data. So we started a lot, started a lot in areas like video, uh, which undoubtedly is a huge amount of data, but it's not what most people would think of today as BI. Um, that is transitioning, and we're really seeing that move more into things like retail analytics, where people are looking at, uh, for example, what are people buying on a given day? Uh, they're even moving to things like uh, video and actually analyzing uh, customers as they walk around the shops and seeing what products are they moving from to as they move around, how long do they spend in particular areas. Um, and so re you really are seeing that shift towards unstructured uh, data there. Um, same thing goes for the financial services space. We're seeing cases there where people are actually amassing huge quantities of market data that's being stored in a number of different formats but they need to be able to analyze that data very, very quickly to be able to determine their positions, their profitability, and so on. So we're seeing this emerging in a number of different areas. One of the big areas for us right now, particularly in Europe, uh, is, uh, is uh, utilities. Um, so this is something that I think had a little bit of hype around it, but it's actually real. We're working on 
uh, three that I know of, and I'm sure there are several others, um, of very large scale uh, um, uh, projects, uh, typically in the petabytes, uh, where they are actually storing data that uh, is either coming back from the grid, so we have sensors out in the grid that's recording data and bringing that back uh, into uh, the data center where it can be analyzed. It could be coming back from smart meters, so it could be uh, coming back from consumers' households uh, where that data is sent back in a real-time stream. This brings up another important point about big data, which we'll come back to with the three Vs, which is the velocity of the data. Uh, with structured data, we're used to running reports on a periodic basis every once in a while. This is a very different type of data. This is something that is coming into the data center on an ongoing basis, and it needs to be processed and understood on an ongoing basis. How the analysis is done, this is where the experimentation comes in. So you will, there will also be an experimentational element to it where we try to discern what, what are the right questions, what are the right ways to analyze the data to bring back some new insight that we didn't already know. So just a couple of, of examples of, of things that uh, EMC worked on. Um, uh, these are both based uh, in the US, but we've got very similar examples uh, to these over here. Um, healthcare is obviously something that uh, uh, is, is a great discussion for the people in this audience because it has a big public sector impact. Um, and one of the things we've seen uh, as we look at the life sciences market over the last few years, something I've been very involved in, is this move towards things like customized drug development, uh, is things like electronic healthcare records. Being able to identify quickly whether a new found drug will uh, provide an actual benefit to patients, whether that drug will harm patients in what quantities, and whether we can isolate a drug down to a particular segment of the population. So we're on sort of a learning curve in this space, and the IT is evolving as we move on. And it's going from things like uh, summary data, uh, where maybe you've got information on a few treatment pathways, uh, and that's moving on as we incorporate data from much larger populations. So instead of sampling, we're actually bringing a lot more data in, 10x, 100x, 1,000x, as much data as we were using before, because the IT has caught up with that now. Um, we're moving on to things where we have accurate information on the genomes of the people that are in particular experiments, that are in particular um, uh, um, research uh, projects. And that's bringing precision to the data and allowing us to make our decisions not based on kind of what we understand from the existing literature, but combining that with exactly what we're getting back from very large uh, population studies. And that's bringing accuracy and it's improving outcomes for those patients. And you're going to see continual movement on this uh, for at least the next decade. There's a huge amount to do. Um, we're very close today to the $1,000 genome. I know Guy will talk about that shortly. Um, but that is something that is really going to bring a day where we really can have a number for every person and use that number uh, to identify how they will respond to some new treatment. That's not tomorrow. We need much, much more research after we've gotten to the $1,000 genome. Um, but you can see that day coming. It's not that far away. Retail banking, uh, the bane of our existence. If we'd had some better technology back in uh, uh, 2007, 2008, we might have been able to avoid at least some part of the crash, which n nobody really saw coming. So you didn't have good ways in retail banks of being able to identify risk positions within those banks. We didn't have a way of identifying that when someone took on a credit default swap, what was the implication for the rest of the bank? It was too much data, we didn't have a way of analyzing it. The banks have resolved to change, and I'm seeing that in the banks today. So there are changes going on today where the accuracy of the positions of that bank from a risk and credit perspective are moving towards a real-time model there is a centralization of data that's taking place where data is being lifted from across the data center from around the globe, being placed in a single area, often being analyzed with Hadoop, as well as a stack of technologies on top of that, and being used to come up with a real-time credit analysis of that bank, a risk analysis of that bank. Um, so this is real. This is not hype. This is something that is actually happening in most of the high street banks you know today. Let's talk about some examples of different types of big data. The ones that I started off with with Isilon were the media ones, video on demand, um, special effects, 
And these are ones where people create new intellectual property. Um, so they're creating, um, they're creating new data, which might be then modified by others to add value to that data. It might be someone creating a special effect for a new film. It might be, for example, the, uh, the Titanic film that came out where it was originally in 2D, that was turned into 3D. That's a big data operation. It requires a huge amount of data to do that processing. Um, so that's one area that people talk about is big data. But this is not computable big data. This is not something where, um, apart from a couple of niche cases, like again with you know, camera data, for example, this is not something I would really put in the computable space. You've got data that's generated from workflows. So we, we work with a lot of high-end manufacturers like Peugeot, Jaguar, Land Rover um, to take simulation data um, from their systems and allow them to avoid the use of physical elements to test their cars, crashing them together, putting them in, in uh, tunnels to test the airflow around them, and instead do all of that in a digital manner on computers. Um, that also is a big data problem, and now you're moving more towards the computable side. So this is data that people are actually using and reusing uh, to be able to determine the safety of vehicles, to be able to determine the efficiency of vehicles, um, and of course also aeroplanes and, and uh, other uh, mechanical devices. So this is, this is something we're seeing a huge amount of momentum on as well. Developing new intellectual property based on existing big data sets. And this is uh, a good example of this, of course, is pharma. Uh, people taking existing intellectual property portfolios, uh, could be uh, uh, um, uh, public domain lists of, of genomes or, uh, or proteomes or other uh, life sciences data and using that for research, which is something that many people in this room are probably already doing. Companies and agencies and organizations in the public sector, as well as utilities, are also mining data uh, for, uh, for to, to either optimize their operations or to provide some sort of competitive advantage in the private sphere. Um, and this is something I alluded to before with some of the uh, large energy companies we're dealing with today, uh, oil and gas companies doing this as well. Um, but in the public sector, I think one of the most exciting things is the availability of very large data sets about our populations, about how we use public services, and about how we can optimize the delivery of those public services. And this is we're really the, the beginning of this, of, the, how, of how this is being done. Um, but there's been a lot of good research into this showing that actually very significant savings uh, could be achieved in the public sector were we to apply these data science principles to these data sets and actually determine, again, you know, uh, how does someone use the benefit system? How can that be optimized? Uh, who really benefits um, from the money we spend? And that's the sort of thing that we have some information about today, and of course there have been innumerable studies done, but by getting the actual data over a history of, uh, you know, over a period of time, we can actually analyze that very, very precisely and come up with, with much more accurate answers. Finally, consumer data. So I'm actually going to wrap around and come straight back into consumer data. The reason I think this one's interesting is this is really where it all began. Um, so the technologies that you see developed in this space, um, whether you're looking at uh, the original MapReduce, uh, whether you're looking at Hadoop, uh, the technologies that have come around that, like Cassandra, um, those technologies were principally developed um, by the big internet players. And that's because they first saw the requirement to process real-time vast amounts of data. So the good news is they've already developed a lot of the technologies. There's a lot more to come, obviously, um, but that work's already been done. Now that is trickling down into the public and, and private spheres where people are saying, I don't really look like Google, but I can use some of that technology to improve my organization. That big data, as I mentioned before, is principally file and object. And this is a huge change for EMC. It's a huge change for most of the customers I'm dealing with. The infrastructures that they're building on are not really suited to this type of data. And when they look at what they're storing, and I've seen many, many slides at big data conferences around this, a tiny fraction of that data is the structured data they run the business off of. And a huge amount of that data is taking up all the spindles that they own, the disks that they own, is actually unstructured data. And a lot of it's been generated very, very recently. Um, you'll hear figures thrown around of you know, 90 to 95 percent of the data in the world was generated in the last two to three years. Where is it coming from? Why is it appearing now? Um, there are reasons for this. So anytime there's a new trend, I think it's, it's worth asking oneself, is there a real reason why this is appearing now? I think about this for things like cloud. You know, why did cloud come around 
at that time? And you, you, we really must ask ourselves about big data the same questions. Um, first of all, things have come around to make it cheaper to manage and store and deal with and analyze. Um, so it's become cheaper. And of course, cost is always the first thing we look at. Disks are getting cheaper all the time. It's becoming cheaper to manage at scale. It's becoming easier and more reliable to manage at scale. And the technologies are coming around as well for analysis, Hadoop being one of them, but there are many, many others. Um, and those technologies are making it much simpler to store and analyze data. Increasing access to data in the cloud. So the cloud is actually causing part of the creation of this big data. Users have access to data in the cloud. It could be other people's photos. It could be tweets. It could be any amount of data. But when they get that data back to their mobile devices and their tablets, they respond to it and they create more big data, which goes back into the cloud. So it's a really it's a, it's a feedback effect. So this also is a major um, um, part of the change. Tools, um, and I'm not talking really about the infrastructure tools like Hadoop. I'm really going further up the stack than that. Um, the tools that are used to actually do the experimentation, to do the analysis, to do the iteration over the data and come up with those insights, these are being developed on a daily basis. Um, we actually have one we're about to launch in the second half of this year that will really uh, make it possible uh, for researchers to have a dashboard where they can sit down and actually try out different experimentations and analyze those results and then iterate and try out different things. These are the sorts of tools we need. And we need these because one of the things that's holding back big data, and I'll come back to this in a moment, is the lack of data scientists. There aren't enough people who can actually do this. Um, I, I'm no expert in uh, the science myself. I did do a little bit of it during my master's degree, but it is quite sophisticated stuff. If you want someone to do a clustering analysis of your customers and determine how they fragment into different groups as in their spending patterns, not everybody can do that. So you need someone with a little bit of mathematics background to do that, and that's why that's going to hold things back just a little bit. But the tools are making those people more effective, more efficient, um, and that's, that's helping to progress things. Finally, prolifer proliferation of data capture devices. And this is another one I think is probably one of the more obvious ones. The sensors that are out there today, the fact that your mobile phone is constantly sending data back about how that phone is being used, um, the fact that uh, you have sensors out there in those smart grids that are sending data back, um, the tablets and mobiles that we have everywhere. So there's a lot of different things that are creating data and putting that back into the cloud. So the combination of these four effects together, that's what's causing this inflection point where people are paying attention to big data now. You'll have heard the three Vs. So let's go over these very quickly because um, I think most of you probably have heard these. But the volume of big data we've kind of covered, right? So we know there's a, a, a pretty big quantity of data that's out there that needs to be analyzed. What's not as well known is the velocity of the data, meaning how quickly is it coming into my enterprise, my organization, my data center? And typically, it's coming in really in a real-time rate. So a lot of people are very focused, for example, on Hadoop, which is a derivative of MapReduce that Google produced. But Google's already moved on to much more real-time methods. That's a very batch-orientated method. Google have moved on to things that actually can analyze the data as it's being trickled in, so that search results are instantaneous. And that's the direction that most organizations will ultimately go as well, is as this data is coming in, as you get feedback from your customers, as you're analyzing, for example, clickstream data that's coming in from your website, as your customers are going through your own sites, for example, it could be something like uh, you're working for a public sector organization and people are downloading forms or filling forms in the internet. That's a real-time process. We'd like to have that data analyzed and fed back into the engine real-time. And finally, variety, the different types of data we got out there. I'll talk about Greenplum at the end, but one of the reasons we selected Greenplum rather than one of the other technologies to acquire is because Greenplum is very focused on heterogeneous types of data. It doesn't matter whether it's flat files, PDFs, images, videos. You can bring all of that data in, and all of it can be analyzed using the same mechanism. And that's a very important part of how this analysis uh, takes place. The Internet of Things, you may have heard this term before as well. This is simply saying that we now have a huge amount of physical devices out there in the world generating data and feeding it back. Mobiles, tablets, we've, we've talked about that, sensors, social networking sites. Um, these are all actually creating a lot more data. If we think back to the web of the 1990s, that was very much a read-only web. It was, a, it was a web where we went to the internet and we, we, we read things, we didn't really submit things back. Today's world is very, very different. There's as much data going back in as is being read. 
and that's a huge change. That data can be used in many very effective ways. Uh, marketer, marketers are looking at that obviously principally now, but there will be many other use cases coming along. To speak just for a moment about the velocity of data, you could cast an eye over this image, um, which just gives you a sense of how quickly things are being generated, the number of emails, the number of Twitter feeds uh, or, or tweets online, um, the, the number of images being uploaded, um, the number of Google Mails being sent, it's endless. The quantity of data is huge. And this data, at least for the internet sites, this is being used. This is not just sitting there in repositories. Google provide email for free for a reason, because they can find out from that information that's in the emails that you've sent what you're doing, who you are, how much are you like your friends or not like your friends. This data is being used, and it will be increasingly used throughout organizations. So we talked about Google. It used to be a fantastic search engine. I remember when it came out, and I thought, it's a great search engine. I, I can't imagine what else they'll do with it, but it's a fantastic search engine didn't really know what they're about to do next. The graph of the entire internet stored within their servers, now Google Plus, so they also have social networking data about you. They know your relationships. They have your email. They have all sorts of information about trends. They instantly know when something jumps as a trend anywhere in the world. You can identify disease trends simply by knowing who's asking to search for something. So there is great value in the information they have. In fact, the entire corporate value of Google is based on that information that they keep. Facebook and Twitter are no different. Facebook is a huge customer of ours, um, and they store, we, we store audio and video for them, but there's a lot of data that they store that is simply structured messages um, that go back and forth between people. The most important piece of information that they have are the graphs. The graphs that go, in, in Twitter's case, from the sources to their audiences. In Facebook's case, the graph between you and your friends network. And that information is far, far more valuable than what Google owned. And that is why Facebook is about to have a $100 billion IPO. Because that information is probably the most valuable information anyone can have from an advertiser's point of view. Amazon, where I used to work. Amazon knows not just probably more about the world supply chain data than just about anyone else, but they also have every single purchase you've ever made. And they can track those purchases you've made as well as those of your friends. Again, immensely useful data. Carriers are not being left out of this, by the way, either. We're talking to a number of telcos. And what the telcos are doing is they know when you've gone from one mobile tower to the next. That obviously, they get that information as you move around. So they know where you're located. They don't need GPS for that. They know that from the, the beacons. And so using that information, they can advertise to you. And we already have uh, majors in the UK, major telcos in the UK, that are already doing that. So there's another use case of big data. Frightening in, in, in ways. But there are also very good uses for big data. Um, and in the public space, I've touched on a couple of those examples. But this is, this is the thing that got it going. Graph theory, sentiment analysis, you've probably heard these terms before, but this is basically the analysis of this data and the structure behind that data that determines the value. That graph is what makes everything so important in knowing who's connected to whom and what they'll do next. So I, I, from my point of view, the companies that I'm going into, the organizations I'm going into, particularly in the private sector, um, the race is truly on. I'm going into banks that are trying to buy up petabytes of market data because they're behind. So there is definitely a race. And it does take a long time to build this stuff. You need a data warehouse. You need copious amounts of unstructured data. You need people to analyze it. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to build this. And there has to be a compelling reason. On top of all of that, and I'll come back to this point, you have organizational change to confront, which is the, um, probably the most vexing problem. Um, because right now, decisions are made at every single level of the organizational hierarchy. And they're made by people based on pretty poor information. If you want an organization that actually moves according to the scientific results of the data, things have to change in the organization. And that's the, the, probably the toughest nut to crack. 
Many companies have got a head start. I mentioned some of them there, but there are some surprising ones that um, you might not know about who have made big moves in this area. Uh, I'm not going to start naming corporate names here, but uh, you know, this isn't hype. There are several, several companies that have already invested massively in this infrastructure, have hired people for it, and have begun those changes within the organization. So every CIO needs to at least look at this. I'm definitely not going to say that every organization's got a big data problem. That's definitely not true. It may not be true in five years. But for the ones that do have access to that sort of data and can make use of it, now is the time to start considering what to do with it. As I mentioned, I used to work at Amazon. I'm just going to dive into one little example in a little bit more detail. Um, I worked in um, building supply chain and back-end systems um, for Amazon, as well as some aspects of the website. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of sense of, of why this big data, or how it's used to provide efficiencies. First of all, purchase information immediately adjusts the supply chain. If prices change, the supply chain is instantly real-time changed. And that leads to much more rapid efficiencies in terms of uh, the, the, the prices that they can buy at. Shipping and logistics are also dynamic and all based on big data. The inventory at every single distribution center that Amazon has is all known real time. Every time you go to buy something, it may adjust that purchase to be supplied at one distribution center or another. It may fulfill your shipment from multiple different ones. All of it is computerized and all of it's running off big data. So it is instantly accurate at all times. The most efficient model will be chosen every single time. Very hard for brick and mortar retailers to compete unless they make their back ends equally efficient. Other customers' information, they have access to everything. They know everything that everyone goes and buys. And now they're starting to learn the relationships between the buyers, between the people who go on the site. This is something that most brick and mortar retailers don't have access to. They're able to use this information uh, to do things like, as, as many people know, recommendations. Um, but they recognize trends much, much more quickly than other retailers do. And they recognize the fragmentation in their own customer base and how their customers cluster and how those clusters change over time. And again, they learn that much more rapidly than everyone else. The big retailers obviously have jumped into this as well. Walmart over in the States is one of the early ones who got really big into ICT for retailing. Tesco, Carrefour, and the rest. Um, you know, we're working with actually many of these to deliver exactly the same capabilities. Good data is very hard to get. So when you think about making a decision, if you're a mid-tier manager, you think about making a decision. How do you make your decisions? What's it based on? It's very often based on what you think might be true, what your manager might have said to you, what you had in a past life at a prior, prior company, prior organization, based on hearsay. Very, very difficult to get in good information. And therefore, a lot of decisions are actually not the right ones. You'll see a lot of companies and organizations coasting along doing the same thing for long periods of time and then the market changes, and it changes too fast for them, and they don't catch it before it's too late. So they fail to detect shifts in consumer demand. This is one of the biggest killers of companies. We've all looked at examples like Nokia, who are now struggling because they didn't recognize the changes, BlackBerry and, and other ones. In many cases, by actually analyzing the consumer behavior, either using their own data sources or other data sources, that might have been detected earlier. The internet has made customers more segmented, more fragmented, and it means that each of these different groups needs to be talked to with a different dialogue. It's not an easy thing to do, but that is, that is what the internet has caused, is for the consumer market to actually be shattered into pieces. And we need to understand each of those pieces differently and not treat consumers the same. So we need to move to a data-driven model. We want to improve that decision-making process. And that means managing with data, managing with the facts, which is not an easy transition. We need to make a science out of it. A lot of people confuse BI, or business intelligence, data warehousing, with, with, um, or data mining, you'll have heard, um, with big data. And actually, they're very different models. Big data is an iterative, it's an experiment, uh, experimentational model. It's one where a data scientist sits down and tries to understand the insights, but often fails and has to repeat the experiment. The results have to be proven. They have to be tested against those results. It's very, very similar to the scientific model. 
We're moving from gut feel to rational decisions based on this data. This is the overarching trend. What do we get if we get to the other side? When we see the light at the end of the tunnel and we go through this, what is the result of it? First of all, the decisions become, and the data becomes more transparent. So we're no longer saying, is this true? We actually have the data directly from the dashboard, the big data dashboard. We have that information accurately back, and it makes things transparent through the organization. It also means that decisions can be taken at a higher frequency. Again, today, we're used to organizations that run a report four times a year, hold their board meetings, make decisions, and then move on. That's not, that's not the new world. The new world is a real-time one, where those decisions are made, taken on a day-to-day -day basis, and decisions can change throughout the month based on what's going on. Information is obviously more accurate. I think that's a, that's a fairly obvious one. You can tailor your products more precisely. Now, even in the public sector, this still makes sense because you're still providing something out to your customers. And that may mean that the services you provide can be adjusted for efficiency, to improve the use of those services, to make sure people come, come back and use them where required. There are ways to tailor what you're offering. And in the public sector, that data, happily, is very much available. Better decisions. It means the decisions, obviously, on more accurate data are, are, are superior ones. And finally, better products, because you get feedback. And this is probably more in the private sector, but it means that the products that are being manufactured actually send back their own quality data. They tell people how it's being used. They can confirm whether users, you know, how, how do people actually use the system, as opposed to how the design is intended for the system to be used. This information can come back real time as well. What's holding us back? Why hasn't everyone leapt into this? Well, it's not ICT. Data storage is cheap. We can buy lots of data storage. That's not the problem. We can buy lots of compute. That's not the problem. Servers have become cheaper than they've ever been, become more powerful than they've ever been. Um, that's not really the problem. It's not the quantity of data. People have got access to data, and again, principally here in the public sector, that, that is more where you have access to big data. Um, and, uh, and the quantity of data, again, for most of these analyses is not actually that large, maybe in the hundreds of terabytes, not necessarily in the petabytes. So th these, are, these are solvable problems. It's not the value. We've already got a number of very, very well-documented um, big data analysis cases where they're, they're paid for themselves very, very quickly. A lot of these cases are in things like retail, where positioning things in shops or changing how coupons are sent out or how products are marketed have proven, have paid for themselves very, very quickly. So, so it's, not, it's not the model. The model pays for itself. The real problems are the organizational change, which we mentioned before, getting the organization to adapt to the new model, and acquiring the talent required to actually do these analyses. And until these two problems are solved, we won't see further momentum in the space. So this is where most of the companies, including my own, are focusing on what they can do to help. And this actually has often very little to do with technology. It has to do with consulting in the organization. It has to do with providing services. So one of the things that we have provided is a team of data scientists that can be hired out to organizations to inform their own models. Um, and this is where a lot of companies are going. Is, is, it's really a services model around big data more than it is a technology one. If you're thinking, maybe I don't really have much big data in your enterprise, it might be true, but consider the different ones you may have. You may track data on your consumers. If you have a website, you probably have clickstream data that tells you what people are doing on your website. Um, again, it could be RFID tags, it could be sensors. Only you know what's in your own organizations, but it's probably more than you, you realize. And again, the bigger problem is not really acquiring more data. Most people have plenty of it, they just don't know how to analyze it. Okay, and just finishing off, let's just quickly dive into some of the technologies. So Hadoopson mentioned before, um, I'm sure many of you know, Google invented their own technologies first, published a paper on MapReduce. That was then uh, turned into an open source uh, project called Hadoop. And Hadoop is a system for processing key value pairs or objects at very, very high speed through parallelism, through scale out. So it's a mechanism for allowing thousands, hundreds or thousands of commodity servers to do processing of data cheaply, quickly, and at lower scale. And the key thing is the scale. 
Because if you want to run this stuff real time, and if you want to be able to address these scales, then you need to have an architecture that can grow to those. If you start off with something that is designed at small scale, it can be very hard to grow it. Oops. I apparently run out of battery. Technology problems. <laughs> Is there any manual way of moving it uh, forward? Does this one work? Or is that something else? No. No, apparently it's just died. Oh, there it goes. Magic. The fairies have come and saved me. Um, OK, so we'll talk a little bit about scale up. Um, the product that um, I guess I have the most experience on Isilon um, was designed around big data use cases. So it was really designed to come up with an infrastructure that could accommodate ever-growing amounts of data and be able to process it. Um, so it has a very different fundamental model than traditional storage. And the idea behind it, I'm not going to get too product focused here, there's really only a couple of slides in this, but the idea behind it is with traditional models, when you're cramming on all those un unstructured files, those objects on traditional storage, um, it tends to cause hotspots, it tends to cause limitations in scalability in the network and the storage and the compute, um, and that causes unfortunate consequences. It causes you to make decisions around replacing hardware. Um, it comes with cases where you're not able to get your data back, um, and it comes with, with simply, simply problems where you have to manage a lot of independent things to get your work done. Um, so, no matter which way you go on these infrastructures, it tends to be complex, it tends to be painful. Um, Scale-out technologies, and this will be true of other scale-out technologies, not just Iceland, but other ones as well, um, are designed generally to be modular. It's because when you want to expand what you're researching, you don't want to have to fuss with it. You want to just grow it very simply. So most scale-out architectures will be designed to accommodate commodity parts. Most of the scale infrastructures I see, whether they're open source based, whether they're coming from a vendor, tend to be lots of commodity parts being joined together. But the idea is, hopefully, they will be holistically joined together in a single entity and allow you to keep processing at the performance rates you had before, plus the power of whatever you just added. And the capacity, as well, will be expanded by what you just added. And hopefully, because it's a single entity, should be much, much simpler to manage that at scale. So that's kind of the infrastructure part of, of kind of where EMC are positioning in terms of big data. Um, and then I'll just talk quickly, this leads into the second product and then I'll be done. Um, we just released something in January to incorporate Hadoop directly into that storage. So we now move to a model where Hadoop, when it's running, can plug, instead of having to talk to the storage over uh, an older protocol like NFS or SIFS or something like that, it can just simply treat the storage as if it were a Hadoop native file system, but with all the enterprise benefits that come in the storage. So we provided this so that we can plug into Greenplum, which I'll talk about in a moment, as well as Apache Hadoop. Um, and it is literally a seamless plugin. You, you can download the open source and, and fire away at the storage immediately. I think we've covered, I think, most of these points before, but the demand coming from the analytics side, so we'll move up the stack now to compute, is moving again towards that complex analysis, deep, rich information uh, that is desired, um, increasing amounts of compute, and real-time delivery of information. And this was what motivated for the purchase of the other product that we picked up, which was Greenplum. So the reason we wanted Greenplum is it's not a, a traditional BI <laughs> or data warehousing product. Most of those are built around optimizing a particular set of queries on the data that you're doing, running those very fast, not so good at experimentation. Greenplum is built around experimentation. So it's built around the model of, I don't, I've got a lot of data and I don't know where I'm going with this. And so because of that, it fo the focus here is, if you don't have knowledge a priori about what you're going to do, the only way really to process it quickly is parallelism is find ways of taking queries that you want to run across structured and unstructured data, whether it's a SQL or a NoSQL approach, and run that very fast on commodity x86 hardware. And that's exactly the design of it. So you'll see it's very similar to the Isilon product as well. It's a scale-out model, but this is now living at the analytics layer. 
This can be use, this can use Hadoop to analyze your unstructured data. It can use SQL if you want to at scale um, to analyze uh, to generally in a read-only way um, your, your data at very, very high speeds. So this forms the other half of it. This is the analytics side. Um, now, we're also releasing tools around both of these. So we're also releasing tools out to the marketplace to facilitate uh, easier analysis of data, to help the data scientists progress through different experiments uh, and make uh, their working life more efficient. EMC, like many companies, have, op have uh, openly embraced Hadoop. That is, uh, is absolutely the direction of the market, and there's no reason to ignore that. So we, we have invested in Hadoop. Uh, we have several committers to, Hadoop, to, uh, to the open source code base within EMC. Uh, we're making very big efforts in this direction. And that's it. So just to finish off the stack, um, again, EMC, um, very focused on the space, simply because of our dominance in storage, uh, and now uh, in big data. Uh, and we are very committed to providing tools to all of you to help move you along this journey towards big data. Um, and we do provide a complete stack going from the storage layer, uh, going all the way up to the analysis layer. But I hope, I hope um, as you look at the presentations um, through the rest of the day, I hope you can maybe compare those to what you're doing now, hopefully see some of the struggles, some of the challenges that they faced. And again, I, I suspect despite this discussion here of products and infrastructure, they're not going to be product and infrastructure problems. Uh, it's the, the thing to really, I think, to really get out of today is what are the organizational changes required for this? What does this mean for my organization? And how decisions are going to be made at the top, at the executive layer, middle management, down to the bottom? What does that mean for the hierarchy, for the tree? Um, and what is it going to mean for my own role uh, in the coming years? So um, that's really all I have to say about big data. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thanks very much, Rob. A great introduction to the day, I think. So we have a couple of people with microphones who are going to run around the room. Um, any questions here? I should say to the people watching on the stream, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, feel free to tweet them or raise them in the, uh, in the forum. OK? So we've got a question here. Could I ask you to say your name and organization when you uh, ask a question, please? Hi, Rob. It's Ed Zedlewski from EduServe. Uh, Rob, can you speak a bit about what change has taken place, what organizational change has taken place within EMC to deal with your own analysis of data? That's a great question. Data? That's a great question. So we pay attention, a lot of attention to our own ICT division within EMC and about how they use these technologies. So one of the things that we've immediately done is revamped how we do our supply chain. So that is now being analyzed with Greenplum to be able to determine how prices are changing from different suppliers, um, which is not just this. There's a lot of other components that we bring in as well. So that's one thing we're doing. Um, we're also starting to look at our, our own customer data as well. Um, we, we, are often, uh, we often have found our, our, our own decisions are, are, are actually quite poor based on the trends within our own customers. And a lot of that stuff really is coming back from, uh, you know, it could be an account manager, it could be a consultant that we have with that customer bringing back information. But so much of that is anecdotal. If we, can, if we can actually look at the data coming back from customers in a more detailed way, we can make better decisions based on that. So we're looking, we, are, we are employing it in a number of fronts internally to do various things. Actually fitting your sales, your account people with RFID tags? And That's right. We're going to be sticking customers with sensors on their heads, yeah. and that way we'll know everything they're doing at all times. Yeah. Um, Rob, can I just ask? A quick question, which is, are you seeing much interest from the education community in big data? Um, within the education community, we are seeing, uh, I think we're seeing more really around the cloud space at the moment than we are around big data. So I think uh, I, I see a lot within the research sector, but not so much education per se at the moment. Um, I do expect that to change over time, but, but not moment. Okay. Any other questions? One at the back here. It's a kind of follow-on, really. Um, 
Ken Chad from Ken Chad Consulting, the, the HE sector is full of very rich structured data mm. um, in terms of both the users and what you might call, let's call it library data for now, the journals, the resources, the learning materials. So I just wondered, oh, I thought it's a very interesting point, you said most of it's unstructured, but what particular opportunities do you think there are in this rich area of, of highly structured, highly organised data in this context, and whether there's anything particular that the education community stands to gain from, from that attribute? Well, the, big data still incorporates structured, absolutely. That's, you know, that, that is a huge part of it. Um, so we are working with uh, a few unis um, right now who are looking at multi, multi petabyte projects, more around cloud, but some of them are moving more towards collaboration as well, ideas about creating app stores um, for both uh, uh, academic staff as well as students um, uh, and uh, collecting information back from those students about how they use the services. Again, it's fairly embryonic for us right now, so I don't have a lot of information on kind of how it could be used. I suppose I could, I, I could come up with some guesses on how it could be used, um, but, uh, but certainly I wouldn't want to exclude structured data from big data. That's a very big portion of it. Greenplum was originally uh, a product that was focused on uh, structured uh, data at scale. Um, so it's still a very important part of it, absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, I would say, I would say within, um, you know, within HE, if you're, if you're stretching out to, uh, is that including research or not including research? Well, I think research is, is a, an area that's growing into importance, but even yeah. the basic, like, take the Amazon example. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of structured data about books, but journals, uh, that whole thing, I was just thinking what particular, I, I take it's not there, of course you're dealing with it, but I just wondered if you saw any special uh, um, potential. We're, we're seeing some movements around things like intellectual property portfolios that's right. being done in the HE space, so there's some of that that's going on. Um, but I'm still looking for some, some, some kind of, um, I suppose, leader examples in this space in terms of how it's being used. It's not something I've seen come up a lot um, at the conferences, but uh, I'd love well, to be proven wrong. You need to move slightly. This will be closer to the <laughs> microphone. Can everyone hear me now? Good. <laughs> Any questions from Twitter? No, nothing. Okay, what I'm gonna, oh, I apologize. There's one at the end, I'll make this the last question. Hi, uh, my name's Miles Danson, I'm from JISC. Uh, thanks for the last question, I better make it a good one. Uh, big data and analytics, is it all about data exhaust being um, actors, interactions with systems and services, um, which I also know as activity data? That seemed to be the thrust of your talk. Is there anything else in there about big data? I, I, missed, I missed one of the words at the beginning. You said about actors, is that what you said? Yeah, um, uh, I think the actors you've been talking about are mostly customers um, and their data exhaust, so the information they leave behind um, after their interactions with systems and services. I is see. that the gist of what big data is? Um, is it the gist of it? Um, Mm, not necessarily. I mean, so, certainly if we want to capture electronic data back from people in an accurate form, it certainly helps if they're providing that data through a website, through some kind of uh, mobile device or a sensor or something like that, because we know the information is accurate. But there are huge, uh, you know, there are huge uh, um, data sources out there today that have been generated through other means, and we don't mind those. We don't use that information. So it's not exclusive to that, no. Um, I think in terms of the information that tends to be real time that we analyze, yes, that tends to come solely from an actor, you know, approaching some kind of ele electronic intake mechanism, I think, really. Um, but, um, but it's definitely not the only source, no. Well, can I press you into what the other sources might be? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's um, I'll try to give you a good example here. I mean. Uh, so I guess uh, one, one of the things is, is we've collected in the research space a lot of data um, over the last 10 years on clinical results. Um, and yet most, uh, you know, most of the drug discovery that we're doing out there uses a very small portion of that data. Um, that's not data that came in through um, interaction with any of those patients. That's come through obviously experiments, through research that's taken place with those patients. But the data is just not being used. It's, it's being used maybe by one organization or a few organizations. Um, one of the things um, that, for instance, uh, uh, Guy's organization uh, has really helped with at, at, at the Sanger Institute is getting that data out into the public space where it can be used by researchers around the globe. And that's something where, you know, that is a case where we're taking data that's maybe out there already 
and promoting it out there to researchers globally for them to use. So th there are lots of cases of, of just finding stuff we have and making better use of it. Okay, I'm going to wrap this session up because we're running a little bit late. Uh, we've got a coffee break now, uh, which is back upstairs, and then um, if you can manage it, can we be back in here at midday and then we'll be back on target. I appreciate that's a little bit of a rush, but I think there's time to get a coffee and be back in here by midday. Can we just show our appreciation to Rob one final time?